if I think back to when I was 11 years old, I uh, think of uh, a young girl who didn't know how to do her hair, <laughs> dealing with acne, really bad glasses. All I would do was read in my room and it gave me an opportunity to just kind of escape the world that I was in. So to be able to sit here at this table, speaking to all of you authors that I admire, it's like a dream come true. And so I'm really looking forward to this week's conversation of a writer's life. Thank you so much for taking time and spending it with us. So Elizabeth, I wanna start with you. Um, as a writer, what's writing for? It's how I live my life. You know, writing has given me a way to live my life. So writing and reading, which go hand in glove for me, uh, so they, they, they root me and, and deepen my life and, and uh, kind of steady me. Mm. Uh, and, and by writing, I, now I'm, I'm simply talking about keeping myself company as I write in my notebooks. The, the idea of writing a book or a story, that's something else you're working on making something. Mm. But it's, it makes me feel more alive. Mm. Writing does and so does reading. Well, I want to ask all of you about that. Uh, Vincent, you have another uh, life as a physician, um, and now you write. You've been writing for a while. What does writing give to your life that being a physician doesn't? Well, similar to Liz, it's a way of inhabiting this thing which is my life. Mm -hmm. And so I do write fiction which is rooted in medicine as well as fiction which isn't. But to your question, the fiction which is rooted in medicine allows me to tap into, I think, some of the currents which are flowing beneath the surface. And uh, sometimes we're obliged to live life on the surface, mm. and yet those deeper currents are always there, and it's a way for me to access those. And Taya, what about you? Um, I think that writing is often a way to make a problem into a place, a place that uh, readers and myself can enter into to try to think through the paces of that problem. Though I often joke that what I wind up doing is outsourcing my problems, just giving them to the readers so I don't have to solve them myself. Oh, that's very interesting. <laughs> I want to come back to that. <laughs> um, and George, what about you? For me, it's a question of recovering history mm. and histories, plural, that are extremely essential for understanding uh, the composition of society, the functioning of society, uh, the aspiration, unfinished, unaccomplished aspiration for justice. Mm. Uh, and those are my motivations. And I want to follow this up with a quick poem mm. uh, to exercise the prerogative of a poet to always have a poem. <laughs> this is Vision of Justice. I see the moon hunted down, spooked from hills. Roses hammer his coffin shut. Oh, stilled by stuttered slander, judicial gossip, and a killer's brawling bullet. Bludgeoned men noosed by loose law swing from pines. Judges chalked commandants gavel, dour commandments. Their law books yawn like lime white open pits, lettered with bones, charred gibberish of those who dared to love or sing and fell to mobs. Language has become volatile liquor, fire water that lovers pour for profits, whom haul from air tons of Pentecostal fire. Poetry come among us. Thank well you. done. That was brilliant. Can we do? Can. Yeah, you know, <laughs> <laughs> actually how I began writing was through poetry. Uh, you know, so. it was uh, kind of a, um, I had always been a big reader, but had no notion I could write. And then there was this surprising moment that happened in an English class where we were asked to read a poem, it was by D.H. Lawrence, and then turn it over and write down whatever came into our heads. And it was a revelation to me that I had something to come out, something to write about, but it was based on a poem, you know? It was the poem that generated the language. Vincent, you said something that I thought was so interesting. You've described the beginning of writing a book as the abyss, which <laughs> sounds very dire. <laughs> Why do you describe it as the abyss? Or is it still the abyss for you? Because who knows, maybe it's changed. Well, I would stand by that description of the, <laughs> the uh, gaping chasm yeah. into which one has committed oneself. Um, I think before the abyss comes that moment of um, of, of hope, of resonance, the mm. sense that, oh, there's this thing in my life which I'm really obsessed about. That's usually how it starts for me and which I want to explore. 
And so from that comes the commitment to jump into it. Because of course, if one knew everything about it, then there wouldn't be any sense in exploring it. But it's precisely because one, or at least in my case, because I'm obsessed, mm -hmm. and yet at the same time know that there's a lot still for me to learn, um, that I commit myself to it and, and leap into that unknown, that yawning chasm, which is, mm -hmm. yes, so a is, bit of uh, an is, um, is part of the uh, part of the chase, I guess, the curiosity, you want to learn more about a thing. Yes, absolutely, yeah. absolutely. And, and you know, I, I think, um, and to, to draw from George's poem, uh, that, that language is this volatile liquid. I mm -hmm. think that, that is so true in so many ways. I mean, it's true in our modern culture, mm -hmm. where language can be polarizing and divisive and, and quite harmful. Mm -hmm. And it's also true in, in the sense that a chemical can be volatile. And so language can can evaporate and change states mm -hmm. and have different forms and help us to see things differently. And this is part of the magic of mm -hmm. writing and of reading. I know, George, you want to come in on this, but I want to go to Taya first. Oh, I can feel your energy. Uh, I want to go to Taya first. Um, uh, Taya, what's it like for you when you do get an idea and then you start? Is it like the abyss for yes, you? Yes, yes, yeah. it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's so nice to talk to other writers yeah. and realize our problems are shared. Yeah, I mean, I think that I generally think writers only have two modes. You either think it's a day where you're like, I'm a genius. Or it's a day where you're like, oh dear, is it too late to go to law school? <laughs> you know, can I go back to being a doctor or something like that? <laughs> but if it's terrible, then why do it? I know, it's interesting, isn't it? I think even when I have an idea and it's not working or I'm trying to get something out there and nobody wants to publish it, mm -hmm. I think what I always come back to at the end of the day is a little voice inside of me that says, but I have something to say, you know? Mm -hmm. And sometimes I wish the little voice would go away, but often, I don't know, often writing is more excavation than it is creation. Often it's you're tapping into something that is you but larger than you. And, and it's about sort of sometimes putting aside your own emotional needs and getting it on the page the way it needs to be, which sounds super woo-woo. Putting right aside now. your emotional <laughs> needs, that's super interesting. Yeah. What do you mean by that? Well, I think a lot of the time, I have, I've had writing instructors who used to say the most important thing is the story. It's mm -hmm. not... Um, what your sort of moral obligation is. It's not what you want to say. It's not your own politics. It's what does the story need uh, to become itself, really. And the story will tell you if you tune into it. And often I do think that politics and your own moral needs wind up getting in there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the more you sort of let the story lead and do what the story needs to do to, I don't know, wind up being the best vision, the best sort of version of your vision, um, I think that's a, a good guiding star. Well, George, um, Taya said something that I think whenever, I don't know about all of you, but it seems like we live in a world when you hear the word politics, you just kind of like, ooh. Uh, <laughs> it's option B, um, but sometimes, uh, you know, when the way you move in the world is itself uh, a political act. You can't change, you know, if you're a woman, if you're black, or if you're, you know, uh, if you're trans, uh, the way you move in the world itself is a political act. Um, so would you say uh, that writing art is a political act? Absolutely. Uh, I like to tell my creative writing students that every writer is an intellectual. You can't help but be an intellectual because of the fact you're dealing with words, words which of course communicate concepts, ideas, and so on. Mm -hmm. But do you think when you use the word intellectual, do you think that is, I, sometimes I th when I hear that word, it means that the, per the other person, if you're not an intellectual, then you're Less than? No, 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 absolutely not. That is not what I'm implying at all. What I am implying, what I'm, what I'm going to say explicitly, mm -hmm. is that because the writer, every writer is an intellectual, you end up putting forward ideas, philosophies, beliefs that some may agree with and others may not agree with. And that is why writers are the most dangerous persons in any government situation, any government system. We are always the most dangerous. We are the first ones to be arrested, the first ones to be jailed, the first ones to be exiled, the first ones to be chopped up, as happened to Khashoggi. Uh, and, and there's a reason for that, and that's because we deal with ideas, and ideas are dangerous. You change a lot of people's minds, you change everything. That's the history of printing, that's the history of this technology. I mean, when you put out a book, even if it's a, a work of fiction, and I'm thinking of 1984, I'm thinking of Lolita, you know, these are very dangerous books, at least for some people, for some governments, for some regimes. And many books are suppressed. Many writers are suppressed, even in North America, even in democratic, uh, constitutional, government order North America. Writers can run into all kinds of problems simply by trying to express our particular vision of the world. Mm -hmm. So whether we like it or not, 
we are political beings. As soon as we decide to put out a version, a vision of the truth, as we see it, as we feel it, and to narrate that vision of the truth. And I mean, unfortunately, it does mean that, that uh, some folks can become very riled up. Well, as you say, if everything is political, then why do we shy away from the political? So I come at it a bit differently. Mm -hmm. Of course, a different writer, different take on it. And, 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 and sure, art is political because uh, our relationships feed on the world and are shaped and informed by the world. And, and George and I would write differently, you know? So, so my, in my work, I don't bring things to a narrow political point, right? I'm, I'm trying to uh, bring all the aspects of somebody's life and mm -hmm. lives, uh, of life itself, to play, and then leave room, you know, for the reader uh, to, to spend time with these characters and come to their own conclusions. If I may say, though, because um, you've written about your relationship <clears throat> with your parents. Yes. Um, and so how do you balance, I, I guess, living in your truth while interrogating your role in those relationships? Because I think we, if you've grown up in a family, it seems as if everybody has a different version yeah. of what life was like. And, 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 and I mean, it's dangerous writing about your family. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So, so uh, I wrote about my parents, but I waited until they were dead. Mm. And, and, and even then, it was very fraught territory. Would you say, though, because, um, and this I say respectfully, obviously, um, but would you say that some people might say that's taking the easy way out by waiting until they've passed? Or is that done out of respect for them? I think it's done, uh, uh, you know, I can, only, I can only tackle these things when I'm ready to tackle them. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, you know, I, I, throughout my life, I've written quite a bit about my mother, much less about my father's anger, for instance. Mm -hmm. and, and writing that I did do about his anger, I put away, because it would have been too painful. I think, I think you know, this whole question of what we have the right to write about and who we have the right to write about is, is perennial and a, and a great problem for writers. It's something you have to figure out on your own. Um, you said it was dangerous to write about your parents. Um, and I guess from, um, for me anyways, the things that I've re gotten as a reader is it's helped me understand. Uh, and as also, as I've gotten older, the way that I viewed my parents is very different now since I've become a parent. When I was younger, my parents, I owned them. They were yes. mine. But then as I've gotten older, they were their own people before they had me. Yes, and so, so I was in my 60s before I wrote that book about my parents. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm glad I waited mm -hmm. because I could see things from their point of view in a way that I couldn't before. Mm -hmm. So you come at things when you're ready for them mm -hmm. and, and then you take the consequences. Uh, Vincent, you've written uh, about your grandfather. Um, how did that help? Maybe, how did that help you understand yourself, maybe, and your family? Um, what did that give you? Sure. So, my novel, which was inspired by my grandfather, mm -hmm. and I really feel it's an important distinction that it's not about him mm -hmm. in the sense that a biography would be about him, a um, book called The Headmaster's Wager, um, was also very much a political book because it was uh, and is a book which is to do with the Chinese community in Vietnam during the time of the conflict in Vietnam. And it has to do with the role of a minority community within a very fraught political context. And so that cannot help but being political. And I, I think that one of the ways that we can understand politics is by inhabiting characters who are experiencing politics. Mm. Um, and, and I think also that sometimes the political significance of, uh, of long-form writing, and I think this is probably true for both fiction and nonfiction, but I think especially for fiction, um, is that it speaks to the form of discussion. And when I think about the current form of political discussion, mm -hmm. it's reductionistic, it's polarizing, it aims to be very certain in its outcome whether or not there is a basis for those outcomes, right. because that has a great deal of political traction. And I think one of the things that we're doing when we write is we're giving room for doubt, we're giving room for ambiguity, 
and we're giving room for a variety of perspectives. And so that speaks to the form of politics, and doing so is absolutely political. Um, Taya, when we talk about politics, I think we've all kind of, whether or not you want to see it, the past few years, as we've navigated uh, the pandemic, something that was a health uh, issue became very political indeed. And your book um, was uh, set in a time when we are dealing with a flu pandemic. Mm -hmm. um, when this whole thing was happening, what went through your mind knowing that you had written uh, a book about it? I shouldn't have written a book about it. <laughs> it's your <laughs> fault. <laughs> it's I mean, all your fault. <laughs> <laughs> if only I could manifest things through my novels. Um, I think what really struck me actually was how there's so many pandemic stories and mm -hmm. so many um, pandemic narratives that all precede um, our most recent pandemic. And I think what really struck me was a slight bit of disappointment with myself because the actual pandemic was so much stranger and more textured and more wild, I think, than anything that any of us could have imagined. So mm -hmm. I did feel a little bit like, like who would have thought there would be so much making of bread? Like who would have <laughs> thought that all it takes for you know an entire sort of society to collapse is for the stores to be closed for four days? You know, and I thought, wow, like I was really trying to tap in and be imaginative, but mm -hmm. in some ways maybe nothing is as interesting as real life. So did it did it disappoint you? Uh, I was disappointed in myself. In yourself, okay. <laughs> I think I was, I shouldn't say that too much. I feel like, you know, I'm proud of my book. Um, but uh, more that um, I think I made things very dramatic mm -hmm. to make things difficult for my characters. Mm -hmm. And because of the nature of our political situation, you don't usually actually have to inject drama in order to reckon with the fact that the rules of our world um, really determine how people move through the world and there's no way around them. You don't sort of have to invent pandemics. You don't have to do what I did in my novel, which was to separate a country into two, to close the borders, mm -hmm. to make the credit card companies go down. Like, real life on its own, it takes very little to sort of push people over the edge. I just kind of feel disappointed by yeah. some of our <laughs> behavior. So, so you would rewrite it? No, no. I mean, mm -hmm. I, I wrote it. I, like I said, I'm proud of it. I think it's, um, you know, it's... Uh, it's part of, it, it came out of a particular situation in my life. It came out of a particular uh, time. We make the best decisions we can with the information we have, whether as artists or as people. Mm -hmm. But it's interesting to look at it through that lens. And, One and, thing and, I'm surprised by is that readers don't mind. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm like, are you going to talk about how unrealistic it is? And they're like, oh, no, but yeah. <laughs> right. yeah. And, 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 and maybe we don't have to try so hard sometimes. Exactly, you know? yeah. exactly. As, as I think, yeah. Just think I, we I, have to invent. Yes, I, I think that's what I realized, that um, in some ways our job as readers, as writers, is to pay attention more than it is to invent catastrophe, yeah. and that within real life there's there's so much catastrophe if you pay yes. even closer attention. I thought I was paying attention, but it was mm -hmm. a good lesson in, in paying even more. This kind of reminds me, I spoke to a, an indigenous writer a few years ago, and um, their novel was in a dystopian future. Mm -hmm. And then she said, for indigenous communities, we're already living in mm -hmm. dystopia. And I never actually thought about mm -hmm. that before. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Well, I would just add to the discussion uh, the simple fact that, as an American writer said, and I forget her name, uh, we live our lives and we write our philosophies. So everything that we write, whether we like it or not, does, in fact, put forward a philosophical and therefore a political perspective. And again, that is what makes us dangerous. That's why Plato had to expel poets from the Republic in book three, because of the fact that we gather ideas, we gather inspiration, we make up stories. And but we also can't you find a way to from. connect to people, right? Isn't that important? So long as they can read. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so long as they can read, yeah. absolutely. Mm -hmm. And then the power of that is that their imaginations um, basically liberate the text, liberate the story, so that they take from it what they need in order to create that particular uh, universe, that particular world, that particular society, uh, that particular family, its rules, its, its uh, problems, its challenges, its successes, uh, and so on, and to, to uh, take lessons from what is written that they may be able to apply to their own situations, to their own lives. And that is the power of, of creating any kind of narrative, that we are putting forward an alternative vision of order, an alternative idea of how you could organize a society, a family, and so on. And again, that is what makes our 
works so potentially dangerous as well as liberating. Mm. Well, I want to change uh, gears for a moment because um, I remember, I don't know if, if we're Gen X, millennials, boomer, but in my era, if an artist dared to sell their song to like, you know, a soda company, sell out, you know, and mm -hmm. all of a sudden their music kind of devalued in itself. But we live in an age where it's important to monetize mm -hmm. um, art. Mm -hmm. And uh, Taya, your, your work has been optioned for television. Mm -hmm. uh, when you're writing, um, is, do you see, when you're writing, uh, do you think of a way uh, how your work is going to be introduced to other audiences and maybe how you can monetize it even more? Because I know it's hard to be a writer in yeah. this economy. Yeah. Do I think about how to monetize? I wish I did. Mm -hmm. I should think about it more. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't. I mean, I think when you're writing, Well, maybe I, I will ask you a direct question. Sure. Is uh, making a living at your craft selling out? Um, <laughs> I, don't, I don't think I know what, what you mean by that. I mean, I think everyone has to pay the bills. I think mm -hmm. a problem that we have in our culture is an unwillingness to recognize that artists are workers too, mm -hmm. who have bills to pay. Mm -hmm. um, I think if anybody can make a lot of money off of their work, which I haven't personally, sadly for me, um, good for them, mm -hmm. right? Yeah, I think that's a great thing. What I think I find stranger about um, our particular cultural moment is that, like you, I remember a time when sort of, yeah, you would be a sellout if, um, if you sort of made money off of your work. Mm -hmm. Now people are in such a rush to sell out. Like they're in such a rush to put their most intimate moments, I think, on a mm -hmm. platform so that they can make money off of it. And again, like I say, I can't entirely judge that because life is hard, mm -hmm. but I do wonder about the effect that it has on our interior lives, on having a space that is our own, which I think people need to be human. Mm -hmm. Anyone want to jump in on this? I think it's really uh, very true that it's quite hard to make a living as an artist of any kind. Mm -hmm in um, this country, maybe, uh, maybe it's fair to say in, in North America. And I think one of the really unfortunate consequences of that is that it privileges who gets to make art. Mm. And so, um, so if, if we accept that as being true, that it's really hard to make a living, then it means that someone typically needs another means mm -hmm. of earning a living, which is not necessarily a bad thing. I love doing medicine, mm -hmm. um, but, uh, but it's a great privilege that I have uh, to be able to do both, to be able to do medicine and to write. And I, I think that, that this reality probably skews the voices whom we hear from. Mm -hmm. Because for, for me, whether um, my, my books sell or not uh, is, is, believe me, a uh, uh, matters a great deal in terms of my vanity, <laughs> um, but it's not existential. Mm. Whereas for some people to devote a huge amount of time to writing a book would, would be, the question of whether it's sold or not would be existential. And that probably means that we don't hear from many of those voices, mm -hmm. which is a loss in our, uh, in our landscape. And also, and I, oh, yeah. I agree. I think mm -hmm. it winds up being a taboo in a lot of artistic communities to talk about the reception of your work. It means you're a brazen careerist. You don't care about the work itself. If you love the work, that would be enough. And again, that's almost, it's oddly in service of capitalism because mm -hmm. it sort of hides the fact that everyone is a worker, you know, that we all need to sort of make ends meet. It makes it impossible to talk about what we're doing within the physical terms in which we're doing it. It sort of deworlds the act of what we're doing. Does it impact your creativity when you're thinking about deadlines and money and? Yeah, but I mean, I think I think that's true. That's true for any kind of worker. All workers are on deadline. You know, you never say to an accountant, "Is it hard to, you know, get all the balance sheets done?" You know, when it's around tax time, we don't think about it that way. Mm -hmm. I think everyone has to work within those terms, and for some reason, within the cultural industries, there's a real need to hide the fact that we work within those terms. Mm -hmm. And it does wind up, I think, leading to the things that, that Vincent is talking about, where if you can't sort of pretend that you don't need the money, then you know, you wind up not being able to be part of the industry at all. It's, it's always been a struggle, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. the, the story of, of creativity uh, and trying to make ends meet as you do it is, is just a long, long struggle, mm -hmm. uh, hi historically speaking. And uh, it, I, so I'm, I'm, I'm not divided when I say, say this, um, that, that I, I think a guaranteed uh, annual income mm -hmm. is what society needs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, the drive it takes to actually produce a book 
is kind of phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And having a guaranteed um, income is not going to give you the drive. So it's a, a mixture, isn't it, of, of realities here. But do you feel that the drive to make an income gets the books out? I have heard Silvia Moreno-Garcia say that, actually, that she says, when I don't feel motivated, I look at my bank balance, which... Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, you know, I remember, I, I often think of Mordecai Richler and his six children. Oh, I mean, he, he had to work like a dog <laughs> to support his yeah. family, yeah. and so he did all manner of things, including yeah. the movie scripts yeah. and so on. Yeah. Um, so, so, I, I, I'm just always incredibly impressed by anybody who manages to be prolific, mm. who, who manages to actually reach an audience, because I think it takes huge uh, creative imagination and, and endeavor to, to, to reach an audience. And, and then I, I'm also very aware that if an author doesn't sell books, the publisher drops them. Right. So, yeah. so it really is a... Um, a market, mm -hmm. it's a business market mm -hmm. uh, that we're we're never allowed to forget, of mm -hmm. course. Thank you again. This is just scratching the surface of all the things that we're going to be talking about this week. Uh, tomorrow, we're going to be discussing how to read, and we'll learn more about our authors. So hopefully, you can all join us. The agenda in the summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.